All right. Um, our class this morning will be in the book of Deuteronomy, and we're going to pick up in chapter 2, where we left off. Um, and of course, I've put up on the board the uh, outline of the book. Actually, I think this is just left over from last week, but uh, this is the, outli- the general outline of the book of Deuteronomy and how it is structured as a uh, covenant treaty between God and Israel. And we're currently in what we call the historical prologue section, where uh, the covenant document basically tells the history of how this agreement came to be. And chapter 1 had a lot of history in it, and what was most of that history about? Where they had been. Where they had been, what what kind of things were they doing where they had been? In Egypt, in the Lord had brought them out. Okay. How would you characterize Israel's behavior in chapter 1? Sometimes they've been complaining a little bit. They've been complaining a little bit. What they had to eat or what they didn't have to eat. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they ha- they did definitely do a lot of that. I think you've been reading the Bolton article, but uh, <laughs> um, Deuteronomy doesn't really talk about. Or at least Deuteronomy 1 doesn't really talk about them complaining about their food, though. It talks about them complaining about something else. Uh, Something really big. The big turning point in their whole time in the wilderness. In chapter 1 of Deuteronomy, Moses tells about how they come to the edge of the promised land and, and they went in and everything was good, right? Aha! We can't take the land, they said. These people are too big. We can't fight against them. And the saddest words of the whole chapter, in chapter 1 and verse 32, was, For all this you did not trust the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 1 describes how Moses pleads with the people. You know, God has... Look at all the stuff God has done for us. Look at all the stuff God will continue to do for us. Just trust Him. Just go into the land. They didn't want to do it. And so the Lord heard the sound of your words, verse 34, He was angry and took an oath, saying, Not one of these men, this evil generation, shall see the good land which I swore to give your fathers. Except Caleb and Joshua. He goes into that. And so chapter 1 is largely characterized by Israel's failures. They fail horribly in chapter 1. But chapters 2 and 3 are a little different. Instead of describing Israel's failures, it describes Israel's successes after the fact. Um, And these chapters are characterized by obedience and victory instead of disobedience and defeat. You'll notice how those two pairs of things always go hand in hand. Whenever Israel is disobedient to God, they lose. Whenever Israel is obedient to God, they win. Begin in verse 1 of chapter 2. We turned and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me, and circled Mount Seir for many days. The Lord spoke to me, saying, You have circled this mountain long enough. Now turn north. You will pass through the territory of your brothers, the sons of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful, and do not provoke them. For I will not give you any of their land, even as little as a footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall buy food from them with money so that you may eat. You shall also purchase water from them with money so that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all that you've done. He has known your wanderings through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord your God has been with you. You have not lacked a thing. So we passed beyond our brothers, the sons of Esau, who live in Seir, away from the Araba road, away from Elath and from Ezion Geber, and we turned and passed through by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab, nor provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I have given Ar to the sons of Lot as a possession. The Emim lived there, for formerly a people as great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they are also regarded as Rephaim, but the Moabites call them Emim. The Horites formerly lived in Seir, but the sons of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place, just as Israel did to the land of their possession which the Lord gave to them. Now arise, cross over the brook Zered yourselves. So we crossed over the brook Zered. 
Now the time that it took for us to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the brook Zered was 38 years until all the generation of the men of war perished from within the camp, as the Lord had sworn to them. Moreover, the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from within the camp, until they all perished. So it came about, when all the men of war had finally perished from among the people, the Lord spoke to me, saying, Today you shall cross over Ar, the border of Moab. And when you come opposite the sons of Ammon, do not harass them, nor provoke them. For I will not give you any of the land of the sons of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot as a possession. It is also regarded as the land of the Rephaim, for Rephaim formerly lived in it, but the Ammonites called them Zamzamim, a people as great, tall, numerous, and tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, just as He did for the sons of Esau who live in Seir, when He destroyed the Horites from before them. They dispossessed them and settled them in their place even to this day. And the Avim who lived in the villages as far as Gaza, the Kaftarim who came from Kaptor, destroyed them and lived in their place. Uh, now I'm going to stop there for a second because uh, the next couple of stories differ a little bit from these uh, accounts. But uh, what, what do you notice? They go through Edom, Moab, and Ammon. What happens at all three of those places? Jenna? They, don't actually, they're not supposed to actually fight them. They are not supposed to actually fight them. Why? Because the land is being given to them by God. Because the land had been given to them by God. It's the same story told three times, and each time it's a different group. And every story goes through the same pattern. The people come to the region. God tells them, don't harass them. If you take food or water, make sure you pay for it. He tells them the history of that region, and He highlights the fact specifically that He has given each one of them the land. And then He gives them provision for the march, and they depart. And, yes, Mark. I think it's good at this point to, to uh, make the point that God remembers His promises. Yeah. And He had promised their forefathers to give them this, these territories, and so God remembers His promise. Yeah, that's true. You know, you remember back in, well, we, we, we think, we focus a lot on the promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But the promise to Abraham's descendants, well, he also promised to make Ishmael a great nation. He also promised to give Esau a nation. Um, there's not really a promise to Lot that I remember, but at the same time, we see that God watches out for Lot throughout well, the book here of Genesis. It says he made such a promise. Yeah. So, well, well, yeah. We don't have it recorded. Here we have it recorded. Right. And th this, is, this is one of the rare instances we have that recorded. Anybody else? Well, the fact that God makes this land promise to Moab and Ammon and Edom, what, what does that say about Israel's situation here? Well, they all have confidence that uh, when God promises them something, they'll remember His promises. Now, oh. then, that's something that ought to be going through their minds. Okay, well, God gave this to them, we can't have it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point to make. I mean, you think about it, you know, these pagan nations around them have inherited their land, they possess their land, they trusted God, um, and perhaps maybe they didn't even acknowledge the true God, but God gave them land anyway, interestingly enough. But Israel does not trust God to keep His promises with His covenant people. You know, but there, there's something else to this too. The fact that, yes, Gail? I think they ought not to be so arrogant to think that they are the only people on this earth that God has blessed. Aha, yes, very good. Israel is not unique. Not at all. And th this is really emphatic. And it comes up again in Deuteronomy later on. Uh, for example, in chapter 7, in verses 7 through 8, God tells them that the Lord did not set His love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which He swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. In chapter 9, in verses 4 and 6, it says, Do not say in your heart when the Lord your God has driven them out before you, Oh, because of my righteousness the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is dispossessing them before you. It is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you are going to possess their land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you in order to confirm the oath which the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now don't get me wrong, there is something unique about Israel's relationship with God. I mean, Israel is the only nation that God did this with and made this kind of covenant with. But Israel is not the only nation that God has blessed. And 
you know, furthermore, Israel's not the only nation that God is even with. We see that contrary to this pagan idea where every nation has their own local God and their God fights against that God over there, no, God is the supreme God. He rules over all the nations and He's moving them around on the chessboard of history, if you will. Uh, putting them in place one at a time to dispossess these, uh, these inhabitants of these lands. I saw Mark, did you have something? Or? Yeah, I just very quickly just wanted to say that uh, it was amazing how in Jesus' time they had again forgotten what God said to them. The Pharisees were, why, we're the seed of Abraham, therefore mm -hmm. we're righteous people. Right. You know, we can do that today. I'm Church of Christ. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Gail, you had something? Hmm. You, just, you were talking about God, you know, moving these, you know, kingdoms around on the chessboard. And he, he not only is with these other nations, it come, there comes a point when he's with these other nations against his chosen people because he promised not only to bless them, but to, to punish them if they didn't trust him. Yeah. Yeah. Don. Well, similar, like uh, play with Mark's point. Today, God blesses everyone with the grace of Jesus as long as we're willing to obey it. And we are told in many, many, many places not to think too highly of ourselves or to humble before God. It's uh, God's plan, not ours, that matters. And, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slow about His promise of some kind of slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to carry in, but for all to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, and even those who don't come to repentance, God still gives them some measure of grace. It's like Jesus says, He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Um, and it's... The, the, the critical lesson from all of this is Israel's uniqueness is not in the fact that, well, God's giving us land. Well, He's given everybody land. And it's not in the fact that God's defeating their enemies. Because, you know, you read each of these passages and Esau, Moab, Ammon, they all had to defeat some kind of enemy to get to the place where they were. The very last verse, verse 23, mentions the Kaftarites, or the Kaftarim, however whatever your version says on that point, uh, which is actually a, probably the ancestors of the Philistines. And it talks about how they dispossessed a group of people too. Um, nobody's 100% certain, but it, it seems to me that that's who that group is. It's the, the theory is that they came from Crete, and Kaftor is a word for Crete, and all that. Um, now, on top of all of that, it is, um, Israel's exodus isn't even unique. I mean, you read a Amos chapter 9 and verse 7, for instance. Uh, Amos highlights the fact that, you know, God gave other nations an exodus, too. In a a Amos chapter 9 and verse 7, it says, Are you not as the sons of Ethiopia to me, O sons of Israel? declares the Lord. Have I not brought up Israel from the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaptor, and the Arameans from Ker? Haven't I done this? God did this for other nations. So you're not quite so special, guys. But this chapter serves to relativize Israel's blessing. Although God is great, Israel's not so great at all. Also implicit in this text is, yes, God's sovereignty over the nations. We see later on Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8, that when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when He separated the sons of men, He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. God is seen setting the boundaries of the various nations throughout the course of history on this point. Um, now, he's been doing this since long before Israel's exodus. This is just the latest in a series of events that has led up to this point. Uh, any comments or questions on this these, these section here? I did want to say one other thing. You'll notice that there's a bunch of uh, parenthetical notes scattered throughout about the Imim, the Anakim, uh, the Rephaim, and all these big words. The Zamzamin, that's my favorite word there. Uh, just because it sounds so cool to say, Zamzamin. Uh, these are probably all... Uh, the, the, um, these are probably all generic catch-all words for giants, Rephaim appearing to be the more generic terms. Um, in Genesis 6 and verse 4, the Nephilim, which I also take to be giants on that instance, um, and you know the Anakim are described in Numbers 13.32 as being like the Nephilim. They're giants. We felt like grasshoppers next to them. And God says, well, you know, there's giants in the Promised Land, but there's been giants outside the Promised Land too. 
Moab had to defeat giants, Edom had to defeat giants, and Ammon had to defeat giants, and you know, God's been defeating these groups for a while. Now when you read Joshua, uh, it says that Israel, I'll turn to Joshua 13 and verse 12, it mentions the Anakim during the conquests of Israel. And it says that in verse 12, all the kingdom of Og and Bashan who... That's not right. Joshua 11, black. Joshua 11, verse 22. Well, verse 21 and 22. Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Deber, from Enab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. There were no Anakim left in the land of the sons of Israel. Only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod some remained. And those three cities are Philistine cities, which you'll notice almost universally throughout the rest of the Bible, whenever there's giants to fight, they come from the Philistines. So uh, it, it seems to me that, yes, we're talking about a race of giant people here and um, how they got to be giant. Um, well, there's a couple of different speculations and theories about that. It's just that they're there and the Bible affirms that they're there. And that's all we have to go off of. Um, they must have found out about growth hormones. They must have, clearly. Uh, <sighs> bit of a funny story about that, but I'm not going to get into that now. Uh, so bringing, bringing us on uh, past this point, any other questions on the, con on the not the not conquests of Moab, Ammon, and Edom? All right, verse 24 has a little bit of a change. God says, Arise, set out, and pass through the valley of Arnon. Look, I have given Sihon the Gamorite, king of Heshbon, and his land into your hand. Begin to take possession and contend with them in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples everywhere under the heavens, who, when they hear the report of you, will tremble and be in anguish because of you. So I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, let me pass through your land. I will travel only on the highway. I will not turn aside to the right or to the left. You will sell me food for money so that I may eat, and give me water for money so that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot, just as the sons of Esau who live in Seir, and the Moabites who live in Ar did for me, until I cross over the Jordan into the land which the Lord our God is giving to us. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, was not willing for us to pass through his land, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate in order to deliver him into your hand as he is today. The Lord said to me, See, I have begun to deliver Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to occupy, that you may possess his land. Then Sihon, with all his people, came out to meet us in battle at Jehaz. The Lord our God delivered him over to us, and we defeated him with his sons and all his people. So we captured all his cities at that time, and utterly destroyed the men, women, and children of every city. We left no survivor. We took only the animals as our booty, and the spoil of the cities which we had captured. From Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, and from the city which is in the valley, even to Gilead, there was no city that was too high for us. The Lord our God delivered all over to us. Only you did not go near to the land of the sons of Ammon all along the river Jabok and the cities of the hill country wherever the Lord our God had commanded us. Then we turned aside and went up the road to Bashan. And Og, king of Bashan, with all his people, came out to meet us in the battle of Adre. But the Lord said to me, Do not fear him, for I have delivered him and all his people and his land into your hand. You shall do to him just as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered Og, also king of Bashan, with all his people into our land, and we smote them until no survivor was left. We captured all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we did not take from them, sixty cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og and Bashan. All these were cities fortified with high walls, gates and bars, besides a great many unwalled towers. We utterly destroyed them, as we did to Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. But all the animals and the spoil of the cities we took as our booty. Thus we took the land at that time from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, from the valley of Arnon to Mount Hermon. Sidonians call Mount Hermon Seir, Sirion, and Amorites call it Sinir. All the cities of the plateau, and all Gilead, and all Bashan, as far as Salakah and Adre, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, was left in the mount of the remnant of the Rephaim. Behold, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. It is in Rabbah of the sons of Ammon. Its length was nine cubits, and its width four cubits by ordinary cubit. 
Okay. So there, and this is not a great chapter division, but there we have the conquest of Sihon and Og, which gets, re these two guys pop up so many times in the rest of the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, as the two enemies that Israel conquers before they enter the Promised Land. Um, now what's different about these encounters, other than the fact that you know, they get squashed by Israel? <laughs> Jenna? God lets them squash them? Them? God lets them, okay, alright. Mark. Well, I guess when they came to Sihon, they asked, you know, let us pass through, and Sihon uh, initiated the war, and then when they came to Og, they uh, they actually went up against Og. Yeah, and okay. It wasn't, uh, Og didn't have any choice, he was getting attacked. Sihon caused his own downfall. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the difference. <laughs> well, that's the difference between the two of them. That's interesting. I hadn't noticed that, but yeah, you're right. Um, it's... Uh, one, one thing that else is interesting about this is that Og is described as one of these Rephaim, uh, one of these giants, and just how big was he? Describes his bedstead was four cubits by nine cubits, which uh, in our measurements, uh, that is... I wrote it in the margin of my Bible and it disappeared. There it is. Cubit 18 inches. Cubit is 18 inches, so we're looking at about 13 and a half feet by six feet. Truly a king-size bed. Um, alternatively, some people have suggested that his iron bedstead was actually, uh, the word is not bed, but sarcophagus, which means that this is the size of his coffin instead. Still very large. Uh, this thing is 13 and a half feet long. Jenna? Did, did Og just come out and attack him in numbers? Or was it the... I mean, uh, that's a good question. Go back to Numbers chapter 21 would be the place where that happened. Uh, numbers chapter 21... Uh, we have a series of two victories, and it's actually a much shorter description. Um, in verse 33, they turned out and went up by the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, went out with all his people for battle at Edre. But the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand, and all his people in his land. And you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. So they killed him and his sons and all his people until there was no remnant left them, and they possessed his land. And that's interesting. That makes it almost look like, you know, it, uh, Og started the fight, but it, no, Deuteronomy makes it look like Israel started it. That's, I think, semantics. It's semantics, yeah. There's probably a translation issue or whatnot. But it's, I, I don't know for certain who, you know, it's like asking, you know, who fired the shot, heard around the world or whatnot. Well, uh, ultimately, God is the one that gave Israel the victory here, and that's the point. It was God's plan all along to give Israel victory over Sihon and to give victory over Og. And, you know, but what makes these two nations different from Moab and Ammon and Edom, though? Why would God give Israel victory over them and not over the other three? God had made a promise to the ancestors of the other three. Yeah. And had given them their land. Apparently God had not given these people their land. They had just, they had possessed it. God allowed them to possess it, obviously, but... Mm -hmm. There, there are, there's some strangely absent things in these passages. One is the fact that uh, you know, there's no reference to a family relationship. There's also no reference to God giving them their land. Or God giving them victory over a previous foe that was there. And so in that instance, uh, you know, they're the big enemies that Israel, uh, that Israel is going to conquer, is what happens. And God gives their land into the hands of Israel. Um, there's some little geography points you can make. Heshbon was actually originally a Moabite city, according to Numbers 21-26, and was captured by Sihon. Here it's captured by Israel. By the time of Isaiah, in Isaiah 16, we learn that Heshbon has fallen back into the hands of Moab. Um, so apparently Israel didn't keep this land uh, when they captured it. Probably because God was punishing them at some point down the road. Um, and, of course, the point of all of this is in verse 25 of chapter 2, to strike fear into the surrounding nations. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples, everywhere under the heavens, who, when they hear the report of you, will tremble and be in anguish because of you. Now you get to Joshua, and you find out that the people in Jericho are frightened. Why are they frightened? <laughs> God put the fear of the, of the Israelites in them. Right. Because they heard about what happened. They heard about the Red Sea crossing. They heard about the defeat of the Egyptians. They heard about the defeat of Sihon and Og. 
And then when Israel crosses the Jordan, everybody gets scared because that's the last remaining boundary between them and Israel. You know, they weren't going to cross that at high tide, but somehow they did. And now our defenses are gone and we it's time to panic. <laughs> That's what happens. God puts fear into the hearts of the Canaanites on this occasion. Now they try to say, you know, they try to go to Sion with terms of peace, uh, similar to the... Actually, there's a law in Deuteronomy that says they're supposed to do this. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 10, it says that uh, when you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. And if it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, all the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. However, if it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. Whenever the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. Uh, only the women and the children and the animals and all that is in the city, all that spoil, you shall take as booty for yourselves. Now it's a little different here in Deuteronomy 2. Uh, they don't leave the women and the children. They kill everything. They leave no survivor, it says in verse 34. Um, this is an example of devoting things to destruction, placing things under the ban. Uh, we see that quite a bit in uh, Deuteronomy and Joshua and so on. And his point in verse 36 is says, it says in verse 36, there was no city that was too high for us. Ain't that the biggest I told you so ever? <laughs> I mean, you know, in chapter 1 and verse 28, you know, they're all, all the people are going, Oh, where can we go up? Our brethren have made our hearts melt. And the people are bigger and taller than us. The cities are large and fortified to heaven. We saw the sons of the Anakim there. We can't do it. There's too much. The cities are too big for us. The people are too big for us. No. In chapter 2 and verse 36, it says, There was no city that was too high for us. The Lord our God delivered all over to us. I told you so. And you keep reading. Um, you, know, you have the similar encounter with Og. Verse 5, cities were fortified with high walls. Verse 6, we utterly destroyed them. Uh, but the animals and spoils are kept like in 235. And so verses 8 through 11 summarize the conquest of both kings. Um, now there's a, com there's a parenthetical comment also in verse 9 for geographical clarity. He talks about Mount Hermon and then he goes, these people call Mount Hermon Syrian and these people call Mount Hermon Sinir. So what's the mountain called? Well, and the reason why is because anytime a mountain acts as a border to two nations, well, the two nations on either side of it are going to name it something different probably. And so that's what's going on here. These mountains serves as a natural boundary between the Sidonians and the Amorites and... But they, they have different names for it. And then Israel, on top of that, has a different name for it as well, since they're in this area. Um, any comments or questions up to the defeat of Sihon and Og? No? Picking up in verse 12, We took possession of this land at that time from Aror, which is by the valley of Arnon, and half the hill country of Gilead, and its cities I gave to the Reubenites and to the Gadites. The rest of Gilead and all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, I gave to the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob concerning all Bashan. It is called the land of Rephaim. Jer, the son of Manasseh, took all the region of Argob as far as the border of the Geshurites and the Maakathites and called it, that is, Bashan, after his own name, Havoth Jair, as it is to this day. To Machir I gave Gilead. To the Reubenites and to the Gadites I gave from Gilead even as far as the valley of Arnon. The middle of the valley is a border and as far as the river Jabok, the border of the sons of Ammon. The Arba also with the Jordan as a border from Kinnereth even as far as the Sea of the Arba, the Salt Sea at the foot of the slopes of Pisgah on the east. Then I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess it. All you valiant men shall cross over, armed before your brothers, the sons of Israel. But your wives and your little ones and your livestock, I know that you have much livestock, shall remain in your cities which I have given you, until the Lord gives rest to your fellow countrymen as to you. And they also possess the land which the Lord your God will give them beyond the Jordan. Then you may return every man to his possession which I have given to you. So even though they've already inherited their land, uh, these are the Transjordan tribes, we read the more detailed accounts in Numbers 32 where they make a request of Moses about this. But even though they've already gotten their land, why does God still require them to help their brothers? We already got our land. We don't need to help. Because their brothers hadn't gotten their land? Because their brothers hadn't gotten their land, yeah. 
basically it. <laughs> that's basically it. Did they earn their land? No. Hmm? No. No, they didn't earn their land. Plus the fact that they, the, the original promise, they, they were not supposed to get that land. By the original promise, no, you're right. The land was supposed to be to the, on the, uh, the, okay, in the west side of the Jordan. Between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea was the land that was promised to them. And so mm -hmm. this was actually an extra gift right. to them. And God was not going to allow them to just take their land and take their ease and not be one people. It's always been interesting to me that uh, whenever God promised Abraham the land, he never, to, you know, he, he talks in detail about the extent of that land, but he never mentions the area east of the Jordan. Interestingly, Israel never actually possesses the land to the full extent described in the promises to Abraham until much, much later in their history. But they get this piece of land on the east of the Jordan as well, uh, simply because they ask for it. But, I mean, here, Moses says that God gave you this land. It's a gift of God. You didn't earn it. And you're obligated to help your brothers conquer the land that they're not going to earn either. Uh, similarly, you know, we have an etern a hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ, and even though we have not earned it as a gift. So, are we not obligated to help others find Christ as well? Something to think about. I don't know if that's the exact application of that passage, but you know, it raises some questions, doesn't it? That being a benefactor of the grace of God does not give you an excuse to just sort of kick back and you know, relax and do whatever you want. No, no, you have to do work still. You have to work for Him until other people obtain their gifts as well. Until we have all attained our gift of eternal life. Did they ever uh, possess all the land that God had promised to them? Did they ever possess all the land that God had promised to them? But probably the closest they came was during the time of David and Solomon. Uh, now, he, there's a tricky thing about this, and some people will point me to Joshua 20, 21, I think. In Joshua chapter 21, uh, it says that in verse 43, the Lord gave Israel all the land which He had sworn to give to their fathers. And they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side according to all that He had sworn to their fathers. And no one of all their enemies stood before them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Everybody reads that passage and they go, well, it says God gave it all to them. So how does Israel not possess the land? Well, a good part of that land between where uh, the western tribes had their land and all the way over to the uh, Euphrates River was desert. And it was pretty much uninhabitable. Mm -hmm. And so even though um, they had it, they didn't really possess They didn't go in and possess it as such because really nobody wanted it. Mm -hmm. And they got it kind of by default, you might say. It gets a little more complicated than that even though. You read the beginning of Judges, chapters 1 and 2. Did they drive out all the inhabitants? No. Did they even, in some areas of their land, were they even the dominant force in that region? The Danites couldn't even take their land. They got driven out of that. Well, they, the Danites were supposed to be in the southern area of Israel, um, off to the side of Judah. They couldn't possess their land. They got driven out of that area. They wound up taking a city in the north and calling that their inheritance at the end of the day. Um, so, is, God gave Israel the land, but they didn't possess the land. Not really. The only one that it said that completely possessed the land was Caleb. Caleb. Was the only one in his clan went in and completely drove out or killed all of the inhabitants of the land, and he possessed it. Now, that's, that's the only one of the Israelites that did it. It, gets even, it goes even further than that, too, though. It says that God gave Israel the land, and God gave Israel rest. But if Joshua had given them rest, well, there would be no need to speak of a further rest after that. As it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, uh, Hebrews makes this kind of, this interesting point from the Psalm 95 about how, you know, the Psalms mention rest. Well, the Psalms were written by David, mostly, and so, you know, why does the Psalm mention rest? In Hebrews chapter 4, and verses 8 and 9, it says, If Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that, so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall though through following the same example of disobedience. You know, the Psalms also speak about how, you know, that the whole land, will, that the meek will inherit the land. 
Well, if God had given them the land, would there have been a need to speak of another land after that? Well, I'd say there even remains a promised land for the people of God as well, following the Hebrew author's reasoning here. Um, so that's the short answer to that. <laughs> um, that's a good question to ask, though. Did God, did they wholly possess the land? Well, God gave it to them, all of it to them. But they did not necessarily take it. There's a lesson there. Just because God gives you something does not mean you possess it. Uh, moving on from there, um, picking up in verse 21, unless somebody's got something else on this section, the Transjordan tribes. I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings, so the Lord shall do to all these the kingdoms into which you are about to cross. Do not fear them, for the Lord your God is the one fighting for you. I also pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Let me, I pray, cross over and see the fair land that is beyond the Jordan, that good hill country in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, Enough, speak to me no more of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah, lift up your eyes to the west and north and south and east, and see it with your eyes. You shall not cross over this Jordan. But charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. For he shall go across at the head of his people, and he will give them as an inheritance the land which you will see. So we remained in the valley opposite Beth Peor. Right, so, why is Moses forbidden from entering the Promised Land? He struck the rock. He struck the rock. This all, I think this actually came up in the uh, James class Thursday as well, you know. But also, he did not give God the glory. Martin. Well, Moses. Uh lays the lays the reason for this at their feet. He says, on your account. Okay, yeah. And yeah. There, is, there is a point, and, and we need to make the point, that we can be just as guilty of someone else's sin when we cause them to sin. That's a good point. Uh, you know, a woman who dresses immodestly and a man lusts after her, she's just as guilty of his sin as he is for lusting after her mm -hmm. because she's dressed in a provocative manner. Right. And I've heard, I've even heard Christian girls say, "Well, I'm going to wear my bikini, and you just deal with it." Well, that's a bad attitude. And here, the people drove Moses to a point of frustration, and he did the wrong thing. Yes, he made the wrong choice, and yes, he bore the responsibility for it. But really, so did they. <laughs> you know, it's interesting here. God, Moses has made a lot of requests over the years for God to overturn his decisions, and he's pleaded with them on their behalf. Uh, you know, he pleads to the people, don't destroy this people, and over and over. And Moses has interceded for this people time and time again, and God has heard him. But this time Moses intercedes for himself, and not this time. God is angry with Moses on the people's account. And what's interesting to me, this is one of the few times in Scripture where God actually tells somebody to stop praying for something. Enough, he says. There's a time to pray, and there's a time to stop praying. He says, I'm not giving it to you, no matter how much you ask. And it is not that Moses is punished directly for the people's sins, but rather that Moses was unable to avoid being contaminated by those people that he bore the burden of. Um, and so God's one concession to Moses is that he may see the land from a distance. He will climb up to the top of Mount Pisgah, which is also called Mount Nebo later on in Deuteronomy 34. But Moses will not be permitted to cross over. And so Moses' personal request is answered no by God. There's a lesson in that about prayer for us, too. You know, we may pray to God. We may think that, you know, we've got this right. We've got the absolute right thing for ourselves in mind. But it doesn't matter because God's wisdom trumps ours and God's authority trumps ours. And no matter what we think is right, God is always right. Um, some people draw a connection between Moses' prayer here and Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. Uh, how because both are punished in connection with other people's sins, because both desire that punishment to pass away from them, and then both ultimately wind up submitting to God's answer and authority on that occasion. Uh, it's not a perfect parallel, but it is something to think about. Uh, that Jesus ultimately, even though He is completely without sin, He petitions God that the cup might pass from Him, but ultimately He concedes to God's will. He says, not what I will, but what you will. And so... The conclusion of all of this is the people remain in the valley opposite Beth Peor. 
And this is really what becomes the setting for all of Moses' speeches in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, the beginning of Deuteronomy sets up this fact that Moses is not going to be entering the promised land at the end. And the beginning of Deuteronomy also establishes that Israel's fate is going to be conditional on their obedience. If they rebel, God is going to punish them. They will be defeated before their enemies. They will not be able to stand. But if they obey, God will save them. God will defeat their enemies. God will deliver them and bless them. And so Israel has a choice set before them. They can choose to obey or disobey. They can choose to live or they can choose to die. This is the choice that's presented to them in chapter 30. In chapter 30, in verses 19 and 20, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying His voice, and by holding fast to Him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. Any comments or questions on the historical prologue? Could I make another comment? Sure. I've given them the land. Uh, we can read even over in the book of Kings, that even in the time of King David, he had to fight to secure some of the property. The Philistines, for example, had mm -hmm. a battle and so forth. And people use the phrase, <clears throat> salvation is a gift of God. Therefore, we do not, that God does not require anything of us. Mm -hmm. No baptism, no anything like that. It's a gift of God. Well, for them to possess that land, they had to do their part too. And I think my comment that I'm trying to say is for us to uh, receive salvation, there's a part for us, even though it is, in a way, a gift from God. Just yeah. To make it for those people, uh, they had to do their part. Yeah, no, well put. I, I was trying to say a little bit of that earlier, but I didn't fully flesh it out the way you did. That's, that's good, yeah. No, the, um, just because God gives us something freely doesn't mean that we just sit back and do nothing. God requires something of us, and what we're doing does not equal actually getting it, because if Israel was left to their own devices, they would fail. But, you know, they still have to do something in order to obtain the gift that God has freely given them. So that, that's the question. How, how badly do you want it? God has given you a free gift, but how badly do you want to take it? Good comment. Good comment. Um, anything else? Next week we will get into chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. Maybe chapter 5 even, if we're lucky. We'll see. Chapter 4 uh, got some pretty thick stuff in it. So.